morning, everybody. Let's get started. Um, today we have Max Schonsenbach from Northwestern Law. He, he's got a bunch of work, including the paper. Um, uh, he posted for us on policing in Chicago, so and it's a very data intensive uh, project. So I, I took the liberty of asking him to go for a few more minutes than our typical five. We'll let him do that, and um, I'll keep the cue and. So let's get started, Max. Thanks. Uh, happy to be here, especially in such a prestigiously named uh, uh, colloquium series. And uh, I'm going to say a little bit about this paper, but I'm also going to show you some results from a follow-on paper we have that's actually trying to evaluate the uh, consequences of having a sustained allegation uh, against a police officer. In other words, do officers change their behavior as they accumulate allegations? Do they change their behavior if one is sustained? Do they change their behavior in response to litigation? And those kinds of things. So I'm going to present sort of the paper you were given, and then some results that are very pre preliminary, but I thought nonetheless uh, would helpfully generate a conversation. So this paper, the genesis is, of course, everybody in Chicago is thinking about police misconduct. Um, and, and we're thinking about crime, too, uh, and governance just more generally uh, uh, because of recent corruption scandals, too. And so uh, this is part of a larger sort of research uh, series I have on you know, public sector uh, incentives and how to think about um, employment in the public sector. And so what happened was the Chicago Tribune, through a series of FOIAs and eventually litigation that resulted in an Illinois appellate court decision, uh, got the police to re the Chicago police to release all of the civilian allegations that have been made against them over the last, um, since 2002, basically. Um, and this is a civilian process. It's an internal process. It's an administrative process where uh, somebody who feels aggrieved by an interaction with a Chicago police officer can go in and file a complaint. There is no monetary compensation for an allegation. Okay, it is uh, you have to swear out an affidavit, which I'll talk a little bit about more in advance. And then there's a process by which the allegation will be investigated. And so there were in our time period about uh, fifty thousand uh, serious allegations. Um, emanating from civilians, so civilian police interactions. There's also allegations that can be brought by supervisors. And there's also allegations brought by the uh, uh, police uh, monitoring agency itself based on off-duty conduct. If an officer was arrested for drunk driving or spousal abuse or some domestic incident, it also. So, but we're looking primarily, at least initially, at, at um, civilian allegations. And the debate in the policing literature has been whether civilian allegations merely proxy for officer productivity or if they actually indicate something serious going on or you know if an officer never gets a civilian allegation they're probably doing something wrong just like if every student loves you in the classroom you know you really got to wonder uh, <laughs> you're doing a good job teaching right uh, and so we're going to think about these issues um, carefully and what we thought is you know how do we validate whether these are real complaints so we go to a uh, Chicago gets sued all the time under Section 1983 of the U.S. Uh, federal Code, which is basically a, a piece of the federal code that allows you to sue state and local actors who, under the cover of state law, violate your constitutional rights. And you get damages, like you get damages in tort law. So you think of it as it's a constitutional tort. And so Chicago pays out, on average, $50 million a year uh, for police uh, misconduct suits, more than Los Angeles or New York City, I would point out, which are much larger cities. Um, so. So Chicago's writing a lot of checks. They vigorously defend these things, and I can tell you institutionally why. So it's not just like they're writing checks. Um, they've actually been sanctioned multiple times for withholding evidence and, and all other kinds of, pro of uh, uh, you know, lawyer misconduct uh, in these cases. So anyway, and they go through federal court. Um, and so we think, well, you know, these, and we have a damage measure, right, which gives you some indication of how severe the damages were, especially if there's medical injury, loss of life, and so forth. Things can go into the millions. If it's just about racist verbal abuse, right, I don't say just, but if that's the only claim, there's actually no damages. There's no, it doesn't violate your civil rights because an officer called you names, even if it's racist or sexist. Um, and so those claims actually can't be brought in federal court. So we think that this is a filter for, for very serious levels of misconduct but the allegations that are being generated might be able to predict these things before they actually happen. So can we sort of filter out officers who might be problematic? Okay, and so we look at payouts, we look at the number of litigation, we ask, are allegations leveled against an officer predictive of future, um, uh, future litigation? So the identifying assumption here has to be, however, right, and this is what we're most worried about, the identifying assumption 
has to be that we're really controlling for officer environment because Chicago, and I'll sh show you a quick uh, map here, Chicago is, you know, got a lot of uh, heterogeneity across its neighborhoods. It's a big city. And if you look at, uh, I'm pointing with my crutch, if you look at officer <laughs> allegations, uh, they vary a lot. The north tends to be richer. So if you uh, think about where the Hancock Tower and Michigan Avenue is, it's right here. It's the Streeterville and Bill Coach neighborhoods. This is Lakeview and Lincoln Park. There's not a lot of allegations of officer misconduct. There's some, actually, but not a lot of allegations emanating from those neighborhoods. The south side and the west side, which has more crime, have also higher police allegations. And so There's a little laser on there. Oh, there is. Great. Yeah. Well, because I don't hold my crutch. Um, ah, how about that? The crutch. An old technology is replaced by a new one. Um, so, the, uh, so we need to control for officer environment. So we do that by, by basically measuring officers relative to each other within each police precinct. So it's not how bad an officer are you. It's how bad are you relative to other officers in what we hope is the same environment. And we do it for, for, for district and year. And we don't have great officer demographic controls. We just have age and uh, rank and you know, date of appointment and those kinds of things. We don't have education or race, even. Uh, I think we do have gender, but gender didn't seem to make a difference. So uh, we, have to, we have to, before we go you know, take this to the data, we want to make sure that we're not just capturing officer environment, which might also reflect litigation, too, right? Because officers just have more negative interactions. They have more chances to be sued, right? And at some point, you know, if you're doing, even if you're doing everything right, you might get sued. You might make a mistake. All right, so uh, what do we do? We actually uh, come up with a test which has actually been used in the education literature to study students and, and teacher quality. We ask, when officers transfer across districts, and it's usually at the officer's option, uh, when officers leave districts, are they as bad when they enter the new district as they were in their old district, relative to the new set of officers, right? And the answer to that is it's, it actually seems like they take their characteristics with them across districts. And that gives us some confidence that even when officers switch districts, that they remain their type. Um, and so there could be match quality too, right? Maybe officers would be better in a wealthier neighborhood or a different ethnic mix, you can imagine, because of their own uh, hang-ups or preferences. Uh, and we don't find evidence of that. Uh, it's, it's officers seem to be, on average, of, of a type, especially the very worst officers. And so we also then check the officers who are very worse, who are getting the most allegations, when they switch districts, and they do switch districts a bit more, do they also get the most allegations among officers in their new district? And again, we found that they do. <laughs> and so these seem to have predictive validity across districts. And that's why we think you know, our controls are, are doing the work that we hope they do. Um, so then we asked two further questions before we go to litigation. Um, and we had a debate with the editor over whether these were actually the important questions or whether litigation was the important question. So I'll be interested to hear what people think. But we also ask, are these predictive of, <coughs> are civilian allegations predictive of supervisor allegations or allegations emanating from uh, the outside the civilian process, like drunk driving, uh, moving violations, uh, domestic uh, violence uh, arrests, these kinds of things, where officers, you know, get sort of reported through the system because, of, because they were arrested or had involvement with the, with the police outside of the department on civilian hours. And we find, actually, that civilian allegations are correlated with, strongly correlated with allegations from supervisors and allegations from sort of off-duty conduct. And we think this is important for a couple of reasons, too, because you're worried about proxying for productivity, right? And so we have these switchers across districts. But you could say, well, the most productive officers are the go-getters, and they're, they're stopping and frisking, they're making arrests, they're doing things. And you know, we don't want them to violate constitutional rights, but we also don't want to have a civilian allegation process that really over-deters. And over-deterrence is a big topic now in police conduct, too. And so uh, what we do there is um, uh, we see the complaints from supervisors are not generally productivity-based complaints. It's things like, you didn't show up for work, you missed a court date, you are insubordinate, okay? And we're saying those things are not correlated, we think, with productivity. Um, Off-duty conduct is not correlated with high productivity, right? These are folks who've gotten in trouble uh, for uh, reasons entirely outside of their productivity. And so civilian allegations are actually correlated with these uh, supervisor and off-duty conducts, too. In fact, they're very strongly correlated, and the very worst officers are also the very worst officers in terms of off-duty conduct and uh, supervisor allegations.
which we think are generally the opposite of, of productivity-based complaints. Okay, so then, sort of taking all of that, we, we go to, uh, uh, these are the, I'll just show you quickly, these are the distributions of complaints. And I, we do shrunken civilian allegations, and I, if people are interested in those details, I'll save it for comments. But this is what the distribution of complaints looks like among Chicago police officers. And again, this is sort of measuring everybody relative to their own district and time, right? So, you know, in reality, people are probably even more spread out than this, but we've tried to account for these other factors. And what you see is a long right tail. I think it's approximately a log normal distribution if you really look at it, you know, and squint, but there's definitely a long right tail, and there's a number of officers that really, really stand out. Okay. So, what does this wind up looking like regarding allegation, uh, sorry, litigation? Okay, so we bend the officers. These are um, uh, deciles here, and we break out the very worst. And so these are, you know, the probability that you're named in a lawsuit. I should actually maybe clarify one thing. We're looking at allegations in one period, and then we're mapping it onto litigation in a separate period. So there's no overlap in the time between the X and the Y axis. So we're taking a misconduct propensity we measure between 2002 and 2008, and then asking, how, what does your litigation look like in 2009 through 2015, okay? Um, and we, we break it also to break any simultaneity that may be occurring between allegations and litigation. But in any event, uh, you see the very worst officers are markedly different than the baseline. So officers who are, you know, sort of in, you could even maybe stretch it out to the, you know, 90th percentile, 90, uh, sorry, 80th percentile, maybe even a little bit beyond, are not that different uh, from the average officer. Where you really see a spike is as you go out. This is uh, payouts in a lawsuit. So this is just where you sued. This is where you sued and the city had to write a check, ultimately, either because of a jury award or because of a settlement. And then here, these are payouts in sort of the really big outlier suits, the lawsuits that are over 100 grand. And the reason we do this is because the city council has to approve payouts over $100,000. And so it requires another step of process. And so we're asking, you know, did you make that hurdle too? Um, and so the very worst off, the worst 1% are, um, you know, we have the back of the envelopes um, in the paper, but they're like four times as likely uh, as the average officer to be involved in one of these large payout events. And then damages in some ways is even, you know, more pronounced. This is log damages in a lawsuit. Uh, and so again, really all the action is happening from uh, the top 10%. Um, especially the worst 1%. We also do a quantile, I didn't show it here, but we do a quantile regression where we really look at where are the extreme lawsuits, and the extreme lawsuits really are just in the top 5%. Like, if you, if, and the probabilities are so strong that if you're an officer in the top, if you're the worst 1% of officers in Chicago, there's a 50% chance that there will be a payout made on your behalf by the city in a 10-year period. Okay. Uh, and and you're, you're comprising about, that 1% is comprising about 30% of the mega payouts. Okay, so these are pretty, pretty big differentials. Um, okay, and so we think, you know, we conclude from this, and this is trying to, you know, put in a, I'm glossing over a lot of details, but we conclude from this that actually civilian allegations have information. And they should be used, uh, they could be used to predict and identify the, the, the very problem officers. We're not saying they should be used solely. Uh, uh, there's other mechanisms, there's other metrics that could be used. Uh, but right now, um, the city of Chicago cannot actually use civilian allegations to identify or discipline or otherwise affect the uh, career prospects of problem officers under the uh, police contract, although there's a consent decree that was just approved and I haven't had time to read. Uh, that with it in its final form, that may be changing. Uh, and so, you know, some cities have early intervention systems where they actually use this as one tool or as a metric to try to identify uh, problem officers and maybe stage an intervention. That doesn't mean you necessarily fire someone, uh, but you might intervene, reassign them, uh, figure out what's going on, uh, maybe offer more training or counseling. Um, Jason Van Dyke, the officer who shot Laquan McDonald, which I don't know if you followed that, uh, he was recently sentenced, convicted of second degree murder and sentenced, uh, I forget actually what the ultimate sentence wound up being, he'll probably spend like five to seven years in prison, is my um, top of the head recollection. He would have been in the worst 3%. He had 20 allegations in a uh, five or six year period. And he would have been in the worst 3% of our office. He's not actually the worst, but he would have been, if you had a, a metric that cut it off at 5%, you would have identified him 
And indeed, you know, if you'd have waited for sort of severity, you know, which we haven't done actually, uh, because we don't really have the metrics to do it, but if you really look at his files, you might think that he was actually particularly, when he did get an allegation, it was a particularly serious allegation. And so what is the second project? So the second project uh, is, trying to, is, is trying to do, um, ask the question, well, what is the consequence, in Chicago at least, of, um, let's see what I want to do, I want to do. Can you do it in, say, three, four minutes? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I wouldn't even take that long. Um, so the civilian allegation process, 98% of the complaints result in no action. And the 2% that are sustained result in very limited discipline, or have historically. There's a new system that's being implemented, and so I'm just looking backwards. So there is, this is changing. Um, so during the period of our study, uh, only 2% of allegations were sustained, and the punishments were you know, often no punishment or a week suspension and so forth. And only one officer uh, was ever fired as part of a civilian allegation process, okay, solely as part of a civilian allegation process. So it was extremely rare that, that anything, even though there was a pretty big infrastructure to, to investigate these things, that anything happened. So we, in this follow-on paper, say, well, what happened when you know, the 300 allegations that were sustained, how did officers change their behavior? And here, uh, we have graphed their average allegations uh, prior to zero, which is the city administrator, administrative agency found that you had you know, violated someone's civil rights or violated the police code of conduct or something like that. Uh, and so you see the allegations trending down and then continue to trend down for even, uh, I think these are six month, no, these are years, these are years. Yeah, we've, we have six month dots. Um, it looks like the event is not very clean. It's something we're gonna have to deal with, but the, the allegations that are sustained take about two to three years to process, right? So the officers are getting information in this window here about the likelihood that their allegations are gonna be sustained. And so the event window is probably really a fat line, a bar, not a line, uh, here. And so we have done some other work in the data just to identify, uh, sorry, page down. Yeah, this is it. Uh, so the red, and this is my last slide. So the red are um, the allegations that are sustained and how long they took. You see a bunch of them take longer than five years. Uh, and the, the, the blue are the unsustained, the ones that get dismissed. And so an officer knows if their allegation has been being investigated for a year, it's more likely than not it's ultimately going to wind up being sustained. And of course, there's been a discovery process, an administrative process during this period where information is getting so we don't have like a clean event window, but we do have, I think, you know, some significant changes, some significant behavioral changes, and we want to try to suss out whether that's incapacitation because the city does something to the officers, or whether it's specific deterrence, uh, whether the officer's behavior is changing itself, him, him or herself, in light of uh, having had a sustained delegation. Yeah. All right. So Sorry. I'll Candace. Uh, I might sit down now. A couple of questions. Uh, yeah. One, have you presented this to the uh, to the Chicago Police Department? And if so, does that explain the crutch? <laughs> <laughs> and more seriously, uh, is is there a, a simultaneity problem here where uh -huh. uh, you're using the the um, payout as uh, uh, the uh, uh, the independent variable. I'm sorry, the dependent variable. Mm -hmm. uh, you're using allegate allegations as the independent variable, but could the payout? I'm sorry, I'm getting this backward. Yeah. My my question is, do the allegations themselves contribute to the probability yeah. of the payout? In other words. Does it become part of the negotiation uh, for a settlement? Yeah. Look, your guy looks really bad because yeah. he's had 20, uh, uh, 20 allegations in the last five years. Yeah. So he looks bad, and that in turn, just the existence of the allegations, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, increases the probability of a, a settlement. So, I mean, we can't demonstrate that empirically, but we do have an institutional reason why we don't think that's the case. Because as a general matter, the unsustained allegations are not admissible in civil litigation. That's as a general matter, 
during the time period of our study, these were kept secret. They could be discovered in the course, in certain courses, but there was no central repository for the data. And so it would have been very patchy, and you wouldn't know really which officers were the worst by metrics like these. Today, going forward, I think that's a bigger problem because actually attorneys should be, civil rights lawyers should be looking at this stuff to make decisions, even if they think that the officer, even if they think it's not admissible, they might decide oh, there's, there's smoke, so there's probably fire and I'm going to invest in this. Because the civil rights litigation relies heavily on lawyers' fees. Um, and so the lawyers are really the ones calling the shots about what cases to bring, which is another reason why we think it's actually, um, uh, sorry, it's, it's more heavily on contingency fees than attorney's fees. But we think that's one of the reasons why this uh, litigation is pretty good civ for um, uh, really bad conduct. Uh, so I think not during the period of our study for institutional reasons, today could be problematic. Where it comes up, though, is in the criminal context. So if you're trying to impeach an officer who's a witness in a criminal proceeding, you can bring in his allegations. And that's the only way they were really getting discovered. And so in the civil litigation where the officer is the defendant, they can't come in. And sustained allegations couldn't even come in under Seventh Circuit precedent unless they really matched the, the allegation mat the sustained allegation matched the current allegation closely. So a, a broad pattern of misconduct was not would admissible. not should not be it admissible. Be the same activity. Yeah. Right. Not that it couldn't affect the, the attorney's calculus, but the attorneys wouldn't have known it. So I think today it's a bigger problem. But where actually one of the disturbing things about this is, you know, I've been told off the record by prosecutors that they're Chicago cops. They can't put on the stand in criminal cases because all their allegation records are going to be brought out against them, and they'll be impeached. And so, you know, you oh, you say the person contends it to the search. You have 15 allegations of wrongful search. You know, and if one's sustained, forget about it, right? So it really, you know, it really affects officer productivity. But they can't reassign officers on the basis of allegations, even though they know it's going to affect law enforcement productivity. Yeah. So. Could you go a little bit more into who's making these accusations? Because I'm thinking, yeah. like what I know about Chicago, most of the big bank attaches work on crime. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot in it, like off the books. It's not even drug stuff. <clears throat> it's like all these things. So yeah. are these people, like the type of crimes that are maybe being committed, are they open more to potential abuses? Because, you know, it's like, oh, this cop was abusive to me, but I can't go to the police and be like, well, I was doing this activity. Does, does any of this matter? What's the process of which, who's making these accusations? Yeah, so that actually brings up, so in the paper, I have a, I think it's in the appendix, so you probably wouldn't have seen it <laughs> unless you were reading it very closely. The, the number of allegations began to drop off in 2012, like precipitously, because I think people realized they were just, nothing was ever being sustained. And their financial incentive is zero. And if they're actually going to pursue litigation, the attorneys would recommend to them actually would demand that they not pursue the state administrative process either because they're going to have to give a sworn statement and then that becomes admissible in a separate pending lawsuit and attorneys hate that because they don't control both. They want to control the whole process. And so uh, I don't have a good sense of who's making these other than that they are made more often by, uh, by uh, black and Hispanic residents in higher crime districts. The so shocking thing to me was how often white people make complaints against the police based on misconduct. Um, and that occurs at a fairly high rate, too. They might think they're going to more likely to be heard. Uh, and so I don't know exactly what. It's another reason to carefully control for the precincts. Uh, so I, I think people must do it to pursue like dignitary redress when they feel they've been wronged and there isn't a civil action really that's, that's going to be available to them. And maybe they thought that this could actually affect change. You know, and, it, and because nothing got sustained, I think people got very cynical and, and stopped the process. Also, most of the investigators were former Chicago cops, which really created problems. In, you know, it might explain why things were not being sustained or investigated as aggressively as, as you might hope. Uh, so you do see this, stuff, and it doesn't affect, because we used stuff before 2008, but there was a period where like, it, it just dropped off precipitously. Um, and it, it all coincided with a bunch of newspaper articles and popular media about the ineffectiveness of the process. But, so I don't have a great explanation for that later. It doesn't affect our study because of the period we're looking at. But, yes, I'll leave. Yeah, this, 
<clears throat> follows right on, on, on Nick's. So for the allegations, one would, so I think this is really impressive and maybe an underestimate of what's going on. I think a lot of people would be intimidated by the process. Oh yes. Um, so that that's why I was wanting like Nick to know more about the costs of making an allegation. Are there uh, groups that bind together where a neighborhood says, you know, this cop's just harassing us all the time? Yeah. And twenty people file a complaint. Hmm. Um, are there across these districts? What's the cost of traveling there, mm -hmm. of making mm -hmm. the statement? Um, do you have anything about the educational level? Uh, I mean, so the characteristics of who's making yeah. the allegations, you would think someone without a high school degree is going to say, forget it, you know, yeah. the cops hate me, what's the point? So I think, you know, I'm sort of wondering, yeah. knowing who's making the allegations, could you use that in a predictive way to see allegations that weren't made. Yeah. So, so, so in other words, right you know, you, you're yeah. getting, I think, you know, a, a very small set of the total amount of abuse that's out there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's probably because allegations are, you know, how costly is it? How long would it take me if this afternoon, you know, someone in Bloomington harasses me and I want to go complain about it? Is it? Do I shoot the whole afternoon? I'm going to say, well, screw it. I don't have that much time. So both people with no education and people with high opportunity cost of time may not make the allegations. So, so in other words, I, I'm worried about a bias. And yeah. And you get these great results. But yeah. Yeah. The reporting. I mean, some of it might be addressable by appealing to sort of the precincts. Although you don't know the people who make complaints in Lakeview against Lakeview cops may have been. African Americans from the South Side who happened to be in Lakeview and got sure. harassed for that reason. Sure. Um, but I, I think you're right. Um, it, it's even sort of worse than you know because they had to swear out an affidavit right. in person right. at the administrative offices, and that was often criticized as a deterrent. And the um, Illinois state law provides there's a police officer bill of rights. I don't know if you've heard these things of these things. Um, something of a misnomer in my view. <laughs> and they, uh, they provided that if someone uh, falsely swore an affidavit in a, in, a, in a civilian allegation process, that, quote, the U.S. The, sorry, the state attorney general's office shall conduct an investigation of that person. And so, you know, you're having to swear under oath, and you're actually being, the state law itself seems, to, I, I assume the state attorney general would be smart enough not to pursue these kinds of things. Um, uh, but you're having to swear under oath. And you're having to, you're threatened with perjury, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is, that could be a deterrent, should be a deterrent, um, both to false complaints and true complaints, because it depends on what you think the error rate in the right. judicial system might be, and whether someone could vindictively, you know, use your sworn statement against you in some way. And so we actually do look at, because we thought, well, maybe allegations where people filed an affidavit are more predictive. Right. And so yeah, right. that was a big question in the reform movement. I think they're dropping the affidavit requirement now. Uh, but that was a big question. We find that there's no difference in predictive power between affidavit and non-affidavit. And I think that was the biggest cost then, you know, I guess making one's medical records available potentially. And then, you know, there's going to be a somewhat adversarial process, which can be extremely unpleasant right. to participate in. And you have no advocate as a general because there's no money at stake, <laughs> right? And so it's almost surprising that people bother to do it, right? But it was happening a lot in between 2000 and uh, uh, 2012. That's all I know, right. you know, and they, they seem to have this predictive power. But I think, I think you're right. It's a tip of the iceberg question, and that's maybe why, you know, the good news from our study in some sense is that if you're an officer who, who generates a couple complaints every now and then, you have nothing to worry about because we say that has almost no predictive power, right? But if you're in the tail, and you know it doesn't take long for it's surprising there's not that many complaints, so it doesn't take long for officers to find themselves in the tail. <laughs> you know, five complaints in one year is, is actually going to put you allegations, I should say, it's going to put you in the tail. Um, there's some officers that have 200 complaint uh, allegations, right? 
<laughs> uh, and they're the worst one percent. Right? So they're people who, who complain against them all the time. And so I think so. The question is, you know, I think institutionally, can we make the signal noise? Can we make the signal to noise ratio better? Right. Right. And I I don't you know it's hard to think of going forward. Can you actually make attorneys' fees available if something gets sustained, so that people might have an advocate? In the process, at least to protect their interests or deal with, you know, inquisitor. You know, does it have to be a lawyer? Maybe not, right? And so, some type of ombuds person that could be assigned if cases, maybe at the at the you know the instigation of the administrator, right? That we think this one has some serious legs. We're actually going to put somebody with the person in a less neutral fashion because uh, the police officer is going to be well represented, right? Because of the union rules and everything else. Uh, so. I kind of have to throw my hands up for most of that, but at least we looked at the affidavit question, which I think is part of your instinct, right? Oh, there is a paper on they moved offices uh, at one point, uh, and there's a paper that looked and that did affect the number of complaints, uh, and that was in 2009 or 2008 or 2009. So again, like we we're looking before that move, and so if you're looking across the move, you might have problems with that. Is so only one office, I believe so. Oh, okay, I thought they'd be each district. Nope. They used to be, I think you can go to the district, but, you, but I think to actually swear out the affidavit and meet the investigators, it used to be on like 35th Street and then they moved it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so thank you. I mean, I really like the use of out of sample data here. Um, I have a kind of slightly different question. So I'm worried a bit more about uh, false positives here. Right? Uh -huh. So I'm talking about using this prediction in completely out of sample cases, right? We have a given yeah. cup. And so what you're showing us here is really good. Like if you have that certain number of epidemics, that's correlated with certain yeah. probability. Yeah. But I wonder what happens, what your model tells if I just randomly draw it like a cup from a sample, right? Mm -hmm. what, are the ch what are the odds that the model is my, like kind of cor going to correctly classify that, right? So precision values, recall values, F1, F2, all the kind of predictive estimates, right? Um, especially because you do have a, a kind of a long slash fat tail distribution on your yeah. sworn. Uh, so yeah. I was wondering if you guys try looking at some of those. Um, it was measured. So one way to do it is to run the model, see here's our precision recall curve, right? Because you do have a, so you have very few cups that are kind of dangerous and you get very f kind of um, wide 95 confidence intervals as you move mm -hmm. up there, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways of dealing with that is something like precision, precision recall uh, uh, that tends to actually do well in predicting in those kind of scenarios and say, okay, let's just take a random effects model about each cup. Here's the predictions we get. Now we add those, um, um, the kind of allegations, and look, we actually get uh, an increase in the predictive accuracy of, say, 20%. That would be something that A, tells you a bit more about how the model works as a whole, right. and B, can also tell you a bit of how well it operates within those kind of out of sample scenarios. Right. I mean, so I have to, so I have to, Ask what you mean by out of you mean out of sample uh, because we're it's really the outliers that matter, or is yeah. it out of sample because we're doing a different time period? So you're doing a different time period, which is a good thing, right? Yes. It's not just in sample it's, coefficients. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what I would be again because one of the things I'm yeah. thinking about is you want to implement yeah. it as a tool for people yeah. like okay, how risky is that random cut? Yeah. Right. And so the idea would be in order to kind of show a bit of how it works beyond just the correlation with those uh, allegation is to have, see how well the model actually predicts it. Because a lot of times those yeah. are different values, right? Yeah. Because of those false positives, and especially yeah. because you have that fat tail. So you have those yeah. risky cups, but still, how likely is a risky? I mean, we saw you have a correlation of about, I think about 0.4 to be included in a, yeah. in a lawsuit for the highest ones. That's not 100%, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, yeah. again, if I pick a random cup out of this, right. this out of sample, right. Right, how, how likely is my model to predict it? And then I can actually apply it to just any cup out there, even if I don't have any information, I can tell you, look, this cup has a 20% overall probability of being uh, accurately uh, uh, identified by the model that's going to experience a loss. Of. Yeah. So I think I think my my I think there's a lot that's good there, and I want to come back to it. But I think my first reaction is to say the problem is our outcome is actually measured with a lot of noise itself, which is the the, the lawsuits, right? And so just the fact that the baseline of lawsuits isn't that common, and then you go to the worst five percent or one percent, and it you know, they're almost certain to be sued if they're staying on within 10 or 20 years on the force like that, they're going to be sued. You know, lawsuits are hard to bring. They require a lawyer to agree to bring them. They're procedurally very difficult. You know, Chicago has to pay out a lot for them because they have a lot of misconduct. But and so I think if you're linking this to that, and, and that's part of the problem why we, I think we have the big error bars, because we actually have a, a, a rare outcome that you know, I think is our best option. Um, and so, 
I think the lawsuits themselves are also a tip of the iceberg phenomenon. Um, I'm not sure how to think about what the, you know, how to think of the officers who are really, really bad in allegations but never get sued because there's a number of them, and that's what you're pointing out. That well, it's part of it. The other part yeah. would be people who are somewhere on this curve. Yeah. The model might classify as more likely to be involved just because they yeah. are kind of getting close to that 95th yeah. percentile. And yeah. so something like precision tells you a bit more, yeah. or the ratio tells you a bit more of... Because that, that's exactly the kind of stuff that's designed to deal with those rare events. Yeah. Right? And so it allows you to maybe say, look, this person is kind of getting there, right? Right. Um, so we can see him on this curve. However, the actual total probability the model assigns to it is that x, and so it's a right. bit of a different kind of story because of that rare event. I guess I wasn't, you know, that's I. So we should probably talk more about this um, later. But I wasn't. I was thinking about this less quantitative because because you're trying to identify quantitatively. I think how you identify the bad cops and how confident yeah, you are in yeah, the identification. That, that, I'm thinking we're sort of trying to quant trying to validate the metric quantitatively. I'm not sure. I would just like the human resources department to have the freedom to use it within the police, you know, the internal affairs, to have the freedom to use it. And how, I don't know if we have much to say about how they should combine it with other metrics too, because I would feel, for some of the reasons you're illustrating, a little uh, uncomfortable using civilian allegations as the only metric. You know, because for one reason, they really only identify the very, very worst. And there may be a lot of misconduct going on that this isn't really going to detect reliably. Like, I certainly wouldn't rely on this for the 70th percentile for all the reasons you're saying. You know, also, it's fairly flat, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but I think if you start combining it with supervisor and off-duty conduct and also um, uh, qualitative assessments by, <clears throat> by the precinct captains and sergeants, which, which also these performance reviews, I think those are all, and, they sh you know, and I would let them use them. I don't think we have a great purchase on how they should be applied, if that makes for I think for some of the reasons you're pointing out. Because I know some people in the like the schooling literature want to fire the worst one percent of teachers or the worst five percent of teachers. Like they would like to draw a line and get rid of get rid of those folks using test scores. And actually using a methodology similar to this. I think this is even worse in some sense because all the events are, are relatively rare. Everybody's getting a test score, right? But but you know police officers may only get an allegation every year or two. And that actually makes them pretty bad cops if, if once they rack up five or six of those, and if they're actually already in like the 75th percentile in their danger of moving up. Um, so I don't know if that's fully responsive, but I like the idea of thinking about trying to get like information ratios effective, right? So uh, here you Yeah, I mean, that's basically how like, normal, yeah. You know, and where, and if you can find a cut point of where the information becomes really good. You know, could we, it, should we, do we have to cut it at the 99th percentile or can we cut it at the 95th percentile, right? And so that would, that would maybe help the metric too, even if you don't want to apply it, you could say, this is where we think it becomes. Because right now, I, 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 we are sort of assessing that qualitatively. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely choose different thresholds, right? So you say, if, if the person is ranked in those 90 percent on those allegations, but predicted for the model kind of jumps, so you could definitely apply different thresholds. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, let's, let's move on. Sorry, uh, Michael. I have so two questions. Sorry. First of all, so as I understand, you do know what kind of allegations were made. So, so, so did you try to look at the at the predictive power of different types of allegations? Yeah. Uh, like, you know, one is uh, it's a verbal abuse, and the other is like you know, slapping up. Yeah. And. Uh, the other question is, if you could explain a little bit more how you decompose that error term. And so one thing I didn't understand is where the variance of mu j is coming from. I thought that mu j it was a constant there. Um, and you have yeah, r hat j is equal to variance of, of mu j over variance of V I J T. Yeah, the very. I think the variance. So that's the technical question first. Yes. The variance is coming from different numbers of observations on officers because they can enter and leave the force, and so we may only observe an officer for two years, and so the the quality measure would be uh, more variable. But and mu J. What is exactly mu J? It has a fixed. It has a fixed. Or? It would have a, no. It would have a fixed component and a random component. No. No. V e i j t has a fixed. Aspect. So I'm trying to find my uh, equation. <laughs> so it's equation two. Uh, yeah. On, uh, on page uh, twelve. 
Okay. And it's like maybe not the important part. No, no. Because I don't understand this, I am afraid I don't yeah. understand a lot more. Uh, oh, MuJ yeah, MuJ is the fixed component, but MuJ hat is, me is, is measured with variance because of EIJT, epsilon IJT. I don't understand this again because V is equal to oh, mu wait, J is equal plus epsilon. Yeah, so wait, where's the variance from mu J? Because I sort of understand right, that's what, what you're you doing. I mean, you're dividing by the variance uh, of yeah, this. Yeah, and that's for individual officers. V thing, and that is clear. You want to assign less weight to noisy yeah. signals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But where is? I wonder if that's a. I wonder. Now I'm looking at that. I wonder if that's mis. Um, it might be a typo. I think it typo might. It might be a mis. There shouldn't be variance. Because in then I understand. I think. Yes. Yes. I see what you're saying. Because BJ is fixed, and that's within. And this is by officer. Yeah. And so you have variance of a fixed. Yeah. Component. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, anyway, it's something. Uh, yeah. No, that looks that looks problematic. Because the B bar is a mean officer residual. What, uh, what, sorry, what was your first question? It was about the types of allegations. Uh, so some of them may be less important oh, than right. others. And it might make sense to look at the different types in terms of their predictive power. Yeah, and so when, you know, so basically um, in the data, they're categorized by the intake officer, by the intake uh, administrator. Uh, and I'm trying, I'm sorry, I'm just going to find the, the the table of uh, so a table one on page 47 has these and so the problem is unfortunately they're grouped by stupid uh, it would work better if they had actually coded it better for us mm -hmm. uh, so First Amendment and illegal arrest encompass like two very different kinds of oh, behaviors mm -hmm. and so unless you go unless you get the files and try to really parse out because legal arrest is pretty bad yeah. I mean illegal arrest by itself gets you like forty thousand dollars right in, in in terms of like the settlements that we're seeing um, arrest and lockup procedures could involve excessive force yeah, yeah. Okay. right it could yeah. also involve denial of medical care yeah. it could also involve leaving the person there an unreasonably long time even if they were correctly arrested they should have been arraigned and the officer didn't follow through on the paperwork like so and so we try to sort of push these apart um, just look at arrest and lockup versus illegal arrest, um, and the sample size has decreased too much. I think there is more signal in there, and I think if you look at uh, Jason Van Dyke's allegations, they're much worse <laughs> yeah. so than, than they read on these categories. Yeah, maybe if you just exclude yeah. verbal abuse. So. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we yeah. There's not that much verbal abuse. <clears throat> uh, search related to those tend to be nonviolent. I mean, it's a violation of one's constitutional rights and actually can get you damages, but they tend to be nonviolent, right? And so search-related and verbal abuse are nonviolent, at least. Uh, the others tend to be, have the potential for, well, certainly illegal arrest is a form of violence, right? So uh, I just, I actually want to point out that there's also this complaint called a failure to provide service. We actually group that in sort of supervisor complaints or internal complaints. That's where you call the officer and they didn't do anything. Right, and and that's a really it's a productivity based measure as well, and that's and that's so we we are predicting that from other types of complaints. So the officers that also get arrest and lock up and illegal arrest complaints also get failure to provide service complaints, which is an interesting <laughs> combination. Uh, anyway, okay, so we have three more on, on the queue for now, uh, and, and yeah. um, so I enjoyed I enjoyed your paper a lot. Um, and one thing that was nagging on me when I was reading it was, and I'm not sure if this is a limitation of the data, yeah. but how much would a police officer's partner in the, in the car affect yeah. their current behavior? So yeah. some sort, I'm not sure if that's just a limitation of the data. Then the other comment I had was on your second paper, it seems like maybe a more provocative question would be to examine those 98% of cases that are tried, but there's no standing. So how would a kind of an innocent kind of verdict affect the future behavior of a police officer. Right, and unsustained, uh, yes. not, yeah, not sustained. Oh, that's that's a good point. And we also need to look at 
litigation too, the filing of a lawsuit, maybe the settling of a lawsuit is another event. Um, I, I, our, what we have now suggests that um, litigation doesn't affect behavior, but I don't think we've looked at the um, find the non the null finding of the administrator. Because there are a lot of even in what idea. you talk about, there's a lot of institutions, even informal ones, that thin yep. blue line about it seems how a conviction yep. would make it difficult to find. And so uh, we don't have the officer assignment data that would let us pair them. Um, there is a paper, and I, I don't have a copy of it yet, uh, using Chicago data pur purporting to do that, not in this, not in allegations, but in some different context. We have a FOIA in to the CPD about getting beat level information, in part because the second project, we wonder if it's incapacitation, are you being reassigned to less dangerous beats even within the precinct, or are you being reassigned to desk duty? We can see if you're assigned to a car, right? So that's so if you get assigned away from a car, that might be a pretty strong indication that you're taken off of active policing because you're not going to be a, res a responder. Uh, so we're trying to parse that out in the second paper a bit more, but we don't. I did, we just don't have the uh, the sure. daily assignment. Uh, Jason Van Dyke was by himself when he responded and mm -hmm. shot, um, and so a lot. Of, there are Chicago officers who do, who are not partnered, um, but I think that could be a, a. You might think that that's a part of incapacitation. If a, if you're a prudent administrator, you might pair a problem officer with somebody who's likely to restrain him. Mm -hmm. You would think, and we'd love to parse that story. That's why we're trying to get the beat level data. You know, so did, did your partner assignment change too? Okay. I'm next, actually. So one thing I thought was kind of missing from the, the paper and the discussion, there, there's no sense here of what uh, optimal, mis optimal misconduct should be. Uh -huh. um, there's, some, there's obviously some trade-off to zero is not the right is right. what we're shooting for. Um, and so what are we shooting for? Can you say anything about that? Can Could you somehow test that by looking at some of the, I mean, so you did mention that LA, Chicago, LA and New York have different rates of, mm -hmm. of payouts, which is linked to uh, these measures of misconduct, um, you know, what should it be? And, you know, can we look at some of these other, is there some characteristics of misconduct? Can we estimate misconduct rates as a function of some characteristics of precincts or organization of precincts uh, to get at this? I mean, it's a little off of the topic, but it, you know, the, the assumption here is that we get too much misconduct, which is probably right, but it's not, it's not going to be right for every police. But maybe it's not true in New York. Yeah, that's what, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder if you might um, touch on some of that here for a bit. So my instinct is that, well, my, my, but my belief, though it's consistent with my data but not demonstrated by the data, of course, is that the disciplinary freedom that the LAPD and the NYPD have is much broader than Chicago's because Chicago had a much more restraining union contract with its police department. And a lot of reforms happened in the LAPD after the Rodney King riots um, that addressed some things that only now Chicago may be doing under a consent decree. Uh, Chicago has certainly not had a lot of success controlling crime, right? Uh, even though we have actually more police officers per person than either New York or Los Angeles. Um, and so I, I, I think their productivity is actually really quite bad too. Um, I think the harder thing that I'm, I think that the root of a lot of this is you want to avoid the extreme bad outcomes, and I know they're relatively rare events, but those are the ones that really wreck civilian police relations. And there's probably a lot of underlying low-level problems that are sort of leading to these blow-ups, right? Um, and so you want to control for that, but I think I, I think over deterrence is a relevant concern. I am not as concerned about using what we find in a way that could over deter because you would focus on the worst. Like police officers shouldn't worry about allegations on a day to day basis. They should worry when they're getting when they're accumulating a number of them. And so you would really only over deter those officers. But frankly those officers I want to kick out anyway because you can't bring them to testify. Right, so if their yeah, allocation really records important. are discoverable, that's a really they important. Gotta point. go. Yeah, and so I think because of these institutional details, 
I'm less worried. You know, I think if you said if you had like a, a punishment metric where you rewarded the people below the median and uh, and punished people above, you would completely over deter. Uh, so I mean, I take the point, but it's hard. It's hard to think of the counterfactuals until we get a, a police contract that gives discretion to the city. So we have a question. Um, yeah, so I was curious about your first, like, one of your opening statements about how moving districts really doesn't change the type of police officer at sure. hand, that they still remain their type, whether they're more violent or you know, more uh, problematic. And so, um, for intervention purposes, that made me think about, uh, you know, work that's looked at the types of police policing districts and the racial composition of their yeah. colleagues, right? And so, there's something like, you have to reach a 30%, 30% minority threshold before the police starts having better relationships with the community, um, before there's a reduced level of like abusive violence. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about that, if racial composition matters in, in your um, years of the data set. Um, and uh, again, because this is you know looking at intervention purposes, um, the level of community policing uh, exercises or efforts that, that each district is engaged in, um, would that help us understand that, that there are fewer uh, number of allegations being made, or, or you know, I, I would imagine that being negatively correlated. Um, I'm sorry. So, 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 so the, the, the level of community, community, community. Oh, is that community correlated with? Efforts. Oh, okay. I imagine it being negatively oh. correlated with allegations, right? Because they're okay. doing a better job of interacting with civilians. I see what you're saying. In non-violent, in, in non-confrontational ways, in non-contentious ways. Um, a book that comes to mind is that of Charles Epp. Um, what was his name like? driving um, and he found that there's more investigative stops uh, made of uh, men black men than um, than Hispanic men of course relative to white men um, and there were more investigative stops made of black women than of white men as well and so those investigative stops are the kinds that you know just question people about where they're going where they're coming from and it just allows the interaction is longer right so there's more room yeah. for problems to happen um, yeah. so that's Charles Epps book made and just looking at the overall interaction with civilians is there just more opportunity to uh, misstep and abuse their power because they're engaging with these communities differently um, and to the question about like is there an optimal level of misconduct yeah. I mean I wonder I would push you to kind of think about well is it relative to maybe predominantly white neighborhoods or is it not because the crime is different would it be comparable to other racial neighborhoods as seen in New York and California um, with the same racial composition so there's a lot there. So let me. Add, so I think um, an interesting project. If you if you sort of believe the allegations mean something, which is what you have to you have to believe that before you can go. You could look at um, uh, community policing reforms on a district level because I believe they were on a district level yeah. and, and gauge allegations before or after. I don't know if anyone's done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then also gauge crime rates. Yeah. You know and. You know the, the good thing about Chicago is we got a we got a crime that's really well reported, which is murder, and it happens often enough that it can be statistically meaningful, right. even in across twenty five different precincts, right? Yeah. Which in most cities you couldn't, but in Chicago you can, mm -hmm. um, with you know, six hundred murders a year. Um, and so you could you know you'd have to sort of buy this article and then but then go into you know oh we 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 had no you know if you found no effect on murder rates yeah. or even a reduction and also a reduction in Complaints, you know, you probably had Pareto <laughs> improving, right? Uh, situation from community policing. You know, the harder is what if what if one went down and the other went up? Right. Like, then you have this trade-off that people are, you know, um, worried about. You could also think about stop and frisk, right? Mm -hmm. The pol those kinds of policies, stop and frisk or police stops, are those driving complaints? Mm -hmm. But are allegate they're driving allegations, but they're not driving. Results, right? And that's yeah. the, that's the question in all of this, um, and it's debated in New York. So, you might be able to look, you know, these. I would argue, allegate, you know, based on this work, allegations would at least be a component of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Some of this community policing stuff is being done when looking at like yeah. uh, trust between Latino communities and how yeah. immigration enforcement is handled, right? And so, yeah. um, the allegations are souring of community relations, yep. but community policing efforts are there to be sort of the antidote. Of we've got three people on the list so far, so let's maybe four, so let's... Uh, I'll try to get shorter. Sure. So my question actually builds a lot on Tony's one about how it 
whether or not you know that you know policemen are paired together and then therefore as a pair do they go out and unfortunately it sounds like we don't have that information but i was wondering can you get their names of like are there multiple names listed on each allocation and then can you make a conclusion draw a conclusion if they were paired it was actually surprisingly hard to match officers by name because we, we had to do it with the um lawsuits uh and it led to us having to drop a lot of lawsuits from our data because a lot of officers have the same name or similar enough names that it's, it's problematic. Um, I think we just gotta get the data from the CPD. I don't, believe, I don't believe them that they don't have it, right? And so we might find out that if you're, if you're assigned to a Jeep, you have a partner, and if you're assigned to a car, you don't. We might find out there's rules like that that would let us try to trace that. Um, but the daily data is not, because they're often reassigning officers in response to flare-ups, especially in the high crime neighborhoods, and so beats seem to change a lot. Which is a problem with community policing is that they don't have a relationship with the community because they're being reassigned all the time. So go ahead. So anyway, uh, to continue yeah. my question, the, one of the reasons why I asked that is because I thought it was really interesting that when af after, even after these allocations uh, of the, you know, across the districts, you find that their behavior continues. Yeah. And so I was wondering, do you think they are pairing them up given that, you know, we know he's a bad cop, we're probably just going to pair him up with another bad cop and just like perpetuate that kind of behavior. It's a good question. Okay, uh, so my, the problem is I don't have a great quality sense of what supervisors are doing and whether they had access to this data and could make use of it. But I, can, I, I would it, posit that it's really easy for them to ask, you know, like a colleague in that different district, yeah. you know, hey, have you heard about this guy? Because they'll know, you know, because yeah. they're getting asked by the investigators, right? They would typically get notified and understand right. it, so. Let's get to our last two, Chris. Oh, okay. um, yeah, my question kind of big, piggybacks off of a couple that have already come up, but I, one, thank you for your presentation. It's really interesting, especially as a former Chicagoan. I enjoyed looking into the data. Um, and so I pulled up the data source that you had referenced um, from the Citizens Police Data Project. Yeah. And it was really interesting because you see the heat map of civilian allegations on, on the west and the south side where you typically see it. Yeah. Um, but I was starting to filter, and at one point I just clicked like use of force. And the heat map really heated up around the downtown area in Streeterville. And yeah. I was like, that's interesting because I wouldn't expect that to be where I would see that <coughs> allegation come up. Uh -huh. So I was curious if maybe you have been, been able to dig into the it, dig into it with this project, if where the allegation occurs and the type of allegation has a different success rate in terms of being sustained. So I would think that perhaps if I'm the typical person in Streeterville, like a white person of privilege, and I make a claim against use of force, maybe there's like a ten percent chance that that becomes sustained. But if that same allegation is made somewhere else, it becomes much lower. White allegations were sustained at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't report it in the paper, but I, I may remember that from summary stats that we yeah. ran. Um, yeah, and I don't know if that's, you know, yeah, that's being better able to manage the process or sure. just being taken seriously. But, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, you could look then at, you know, in our metric, we could say what are the consequences depending on the race of the accuser. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So Ken, you may have the last question, or you're close to it. Close to it. Um, the um, one, one of the one of the takeaways uh, from this, at a very practical sort of management level, is uh, concentrate on your worst one percent or five percent. If you're able, if the system allows you, yeah. if there's room, you could actually get a lot of gain as a manager of of police from concentrating on that 1% or 5%. But all of this is relative. That is, yeah. the, the ones that are in the worst 1% or 5% of yeah. those to whom they're being compared. Now, if I'm uh, in one of, the, uh, one of the districts that has relatively low allegation rates, does this do me any good? Uh, that is, you know, am I still, how do I know that I uh, I don't have this problem? My one percent or my five percent yeah. could be, uh, the, you know, in, in the median of any other, uh, and I don't need to worry about this. Is, is there enough absolute numbers in this analysis for me not only to say I need to concentrate if I have a problem, I need to concentrate right. on that one percent or five percent, right. but also I don't actually have to worry about this. I I think. You're probably right. I haven't thought about it in this way. I think it's
it's an interesting point. But the the very the, the better districts, the safer districts. First of all, it's going to be noisier because there's fewer complaints. Um, and so I don't know if you'd want to use this metric there, even though you can identify the worst one percent. You, you can see how often they flip year to year, right? So you, you could get some measure of noise. How consistent are the complaints? Um, but this isn't this is a phenomenon that's written about in the personnel literature a fair bit that the worst you know that there's this uh, twenty eighty rule the worst twenty percent cause eighty percent of the problems I don't know if it's you know we're in the, we're in we're in the academy so the work the you know there's one percent of faculty causing ninety percent of problems one percent of students cause ninety percent of problems right um, and it's not surprising that the police it, you know have the same uh, outlier tendencies um, and they have an incentive to stay on for their pension too. Right, so even if they're, they're they're hard to push out before they max out that pension, um, so even there's a fair bit of churn between forces and stuff. It's there's an incentive to stay, and it's, and and their jobs are fairly protected. So even if they have poor promotion probabilities, because one thing that a that a sustained delegation does is it kills your promotion chances. Like we clearly see that it doesn't kill it like it should, maybe. But it definitely reduces your promotion, and that's and the, there's actually a wage ladder in the police, unlike in teachers and other professions, where a promotion to sergeant comes with a 25 to 40 percent wage bonus, and then lieutenant. You know, so there's definite steps, and and so there is an incentive to avoid a complaint because it will take you off at a sustained complaint because it does take you off your promotion path. I hate which to might cut, be important. I hate to cut you off, Matt. Yep. Matt, but we're going to because we're over. But I will say one good nice thing about you before we leave. Max is one of the finest students ever to graduate from my high school. <laughs> <laughs> it's relative to who? Yes. I have a silver medal. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Max. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Max. <laughs> 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 <laughs>